Sure. Uh, In fact, uh, we have Peter here, uh, here so uh, if there are questions, he can actually answer them. Oh, wow. Not feeling very good with three broken ribs, but uh, he's trying anyway. So I made you the co-host anyway, and uh, let me just. No, we don't have any anything. It's recorded, so it should be in the folder. Yeah, just pulling it out. Perfect. Yeah. So let me just. Yeah, this would be his lecture, and then there are two small films. Who have we still got with us then? Okay. We got, I know that a couple of people have dropped in and out on YouTube, um, just to let you know. But if what anyone is listening, apart from the three of us, <laughs> please do promote this event. So, Pia, over to you. You yeah. can introduce and I'll Thank take you. the play button. <laughs> yes. once we're done. Play the whole thing. This is Peter Wadham. So, also happens to be my husband, he's emeritus professor in ocean physics from Cambridge. He's a polar oceanographer for uh, about uh, 50 years, and uh, he has done 56 expeditions between the Arctic and the Antarctic. And uh, this, uh, this time he's presenting the latest news from Greenland, because actually three weeks ago he was on the Greenland ice cap. And uh, the Greenland ice cap is having lots of problems with uh, um, global warming. And uh, he was also in Greenland two years ago in 2019, when there was the hottest day ever registered. So he is now uh, he will talk about a project that uh, is also going to be carried out with the Polytechnic of Turin, where Peter is now visiting professor. Thank you. And get his lecture going. In this talk, I'm going to cover the latest news about the state of play of the Greenland ice sheet. And this is based on um, the most recent information, including two field operations which we've carried out the most recent of which was only last week. So the, a lot of what I'm going to say is uh, based on my book, which is called A Farewell to Ice, which deals with the retreat of ice all over the world due to global warming. And uh, if you're in Italy, then uh, you can get the Italian version, Adio Aghiacci. I also recommend a film that was made by Leonardo DiCaprio uh, called Ice on Fire, in which he, he flies all over the world looking at places where global change is having a severe impact on the climate, uh, especially places where uh, we're dealing with ice. So for instance, the cover picture here shows uh, a scientist standing on uh, an ice sheet or standing on a, a frozen lake in Siberia, which he's poked with his stick, uh, releasing a lot of methane, which has caught fire. Now, here we are with Greenland. It's the world's second largest island, and um, it contains a very large amount of, of ice, which is capable, therefore, of increasing sea level. Uh, that almost the entire island is covered with an ice sheet, uh, except these, the edges, as you can see here. The capital, Newark, is down on the bottom left of the diagram. Moving up, we have Kangalusuak, which is the main international airport, also the site of a glacier where we've done a lot of work. It's a very impressive glacier um, and uh, is part of the Greenland ice sheet. Further north, we have the Ilulisat, which is famous as the site of a huge number of icebergs. So there's an iceberg producing glacier there. 
So if you want to see icebergs, you go to Ilulisat. Then Scoresby Sant is a, a small settlement on the east coast. We come up to, to, to Karnak, which is, I'll show you some pictures of that. That's the, the furthest north settlement in Greenland, uh, in the far northwest. Uh, it was known as Thule um, when it was set up originally as a trading post um, by a Danish explorer. So that's that's Greenland geographically. This is Greenland. If you remove the ice, you'll find um, that the center of the island is below sea level. The blue here is areas of bedrock that are below sea level. So it's a bowl shaped island, in fact, um, with the central spine that's, that's, that's below sea level. The edges are very much above sea level. The eastern mountains, which are shown brown here, are 2,000 meters of rock, followed by another 1,000 meters of ice. And if you replace the ice, you'll have a surface topography which looks like this, a dome-shaped island with uh, an elevation in the centre of more than 3,000 metres. Now, what drives this? The problem with Greenland is that it's an island of ice, and the problem with ice is that it melts. So Greenland is therefore highly susceptible to climate change. Now, if we look at um, the relationship between climate change and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the two are very closely related. We know this very well, and it's because, of course, uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. That is, um, when the Earth is trying to radiate uh, back out into space some of the radiation, shortwave radiation that's received from the sun, the uh, carbon dioxide stands in the way of that by absorbing a lot of the outgoing short, uh, long wave energy. So the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, the warmer the climate of the planet is. The two go absolutely together. Now we can see uh, from this climatic record, which was kept by uh, analysing uh, ice uh, in ice cores going through the centre of the island, that um, if we look back over 800,000 years, we go through a whole series of ice ages where the earth is plunged into extreme cold and uh, alternating that with warmer conditions called interglacials. Now, if we look over this, we see that the carbon dioxide level seems to fall into two natural values, 180 parts per million during um, glacial periods when it's very cold, and then 280 parts per million during the interglacials. Now, the last glacial period was over 100,000 years ago, and then the Earth warmed up um, to an and as it warmed up, we had the carbon dioxide rising to its natural high value of 280. But the trouble is it didn't stop there. In the past, it's always stopped at 280 because that was the natural level that the Earth seems to like to have as its carbon dioxide level during interglacial periods. But in, the, in this last period, man has arrived on the scene has started burning fossil fuels and that's been putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So instead of stopping at 280, it's gone shooting upwards enormously fast and has taken us to over 400 parts per million. And this is of course the root of all of our troubles as a planet today, is that we've allowed too much carbon dioxide to get into the atmosphere and this is having a huge impact on the temperature of the atmosphere. Essentially, we're warming ourselves. Well, we can see that from looking at the record from the time when we started 
measuring uh, carbon dioxide, which was only as recently as 1958 uh, from the, uh, an observatory on the top of Mauna Loa, a volcano in Hawaii. And we see the red here is the, is the put daily record, the black is the average. But what we can see is that the carbon dioxide level has been rising in an accelerating way, an exponential way, from when we started taking records, when it was only 310, not far above the natural level, to today when it's over 400, in fact 420 was a recent measurement. So we have done something very, very serious and to our planet. And we're still doing it. Uh, this is uh, that same record compared with a list of all the international agreements by which the, the scientists and the politicians of this world agreed that we would reduce carbon dioxide emissions so that the climate would not warm so fast. So all these COP figures here refer to, uh, to climate program meetings of the United Nations, of which the last was COP25 uh, in uh, Madrid last year. And we're about to have COP26 in Glasgow in November of this year, which is of vital importance for saving us from climatic uh, runaway and with it's the most important meeting that we've e ever had on climate and we have to do a good job at it but we can see we haven't done a good job up to now because every time there's been a meeting with an agreement on reducing emissions it's had no effect on the inexorably rising curve of carbon dioxide we are failing in every way to fulfill that which we know we must do. Anyway, I've seen that we failed, but what has that failure done? First of all, it's meant that the, the average temperature of the planet, which was quite steady over the last a thousand years, these are a thousand years, uh, at the end of the 19th century, suddenly the temperature took off and has been going upwards out of sight ever since. That's because that was the time when we started interfering with our atmosphere by burning coal initially and then oil and gas and putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which led to a rapid increase in global temperatures. Let's just look at one or two things that that's done before we move on to the effect on the Greenland ice sheet. One of the big effects has been on sea ice. Again, we're looking at melting effects. And this is the area of Arctic sea ice uh, over a number of different years. Those different colors are different years of, of the recent last decade or two. But we can see that the lowest values here are the red curve and the red curve was 2020. And this is how the the area of Arctic sea ice in the Arctic has gone uh, down to be lower than any previous year. Uh, and if we come down to September of, of 2020, which was the, the last summer minimum. And then we start to go up again. And here is the same curve going up. And we get to spring of this year, and we see that still it's the case that the blue curve here, which is the uh, carbon dioxide, uh, which is the ice extent, sorry, in, uh, in the, the Arctic, the last Arctic winter, has been lower than it's been in any previous year. So we see that the sea ice is responding to the extra carbon dioxide by giving lower values of sea ice extent throughout last year and through to this year. We can see that in, if we look at a typical recent summer, September 2012, where the white is the area of sea ice remaining in the Arctic Ocean, and the, the black is the area that used to be there in, in the summer, 
which filled nearly the whole Arctic Ocean with ice, but now it doesn't. Now we have an ocean which is largely ice free in summer. So if we look at the whole Arctic, uh, the ocean and the land surface, we find a remarkable fact uh, called Arctic amplification, which is that the uh, temperature um, of the Arctic has been rising um, because of global warming, but it's been rising more rapidly in the Arctic than in other, any other part of the planet. So if we look at uh, air temperature change over the last since 1951. This is the, the curve for the most of the world, which uh, going from the deep south to towards the Arctic. But when we get to the high northern latitudes, north of 60 degrees, we find a massive increase. And it's in fact the case that the Arctic uh, is warming at about three times as fast as any other latitude as the rest of the world. So this means that the changes induced by carbon dioxide are, are much larger in the Arctic than anywhere else. So we have to look for large impacts, large effects. And we see that as well if we look at um, the occasional periods when the climate has got cooler for some short period. This is about 1940, 1950. The climate got a little bit cooler for a while. So the red is the global average temperature, which was going up most of the time, went down for a little bit. But we see that the blue, which is the temperature of the Arctic, went up more rapidly than any other of the parts of the world. And then when there was this little blip over here, the, the temperature of the Arctic went down very rapidly. So the Arctic not only warms up more rapidly than the rest of the world, but it cools down more rapidly if the rest of the world should happen to cool. Of course, most of the time it doesn't cool. So let's look at what that does to the ice covered regions of the world. I've shown you the sea ice region. Now we look at the, the, the thicker ice fringing the Greenland ice sheet. And this is Northwest Greenland. This is uh, Karnak, that, that's that village I showed at the furthest northwest of the island. And it's a, it's a village in, occupied by polar bear hunters. And here are a couple of polar bear hunters, uh, one of which I was traveling with, um, using very heavy wooden sledges and a dog team to hunt polar bears in winter on the ice. This is uh, sea ice, but it's thick. And there's an iceberg in the background here. And um, so this was what you would see if you went uh, hunting in March of the year, March of the winter uh, in Northwest Greenland. That was in 2007. This is exactly the same scene in 2019. Uh, photographed by a Danish colleague of mine who went out with the same hunters, the same sledges, and in fact, the same dogs to exactly the same spot as, a, as the fo previous photograph. But instead of being thick ice, we, what we have is this slushy water layer, which is very, very dangerous because uh, sledges and dogs can easily go through, these, through this ice, through this water and be swallowed up and drowned. So that's the difference just uh, about 10 years makes to the ice conditions in furthest northwest Greenland. That's about 80 degrees north. So the, what the first consequence, therefore, that we need to think about when we're, we're dealing with this increase in carbon dioxide is that the Greenland ice sheet is warmed up. And when the Greenland ice sheet is warmed up, and also the Antarctic ice sheet, the consequence is a sea level rise because the ice that melts goes, ends up in the ocean and causes sea level to rise. Now, this is the first big effect 
of global warming on Greenland. Now, that warming has been having an effect for a long time, but it's been quite small. Here we can see the, 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 the sea level rise globally since the year 1800 up until the year 2000, and it's only produced a, war, a rise of about 20 to 30 centimeters. But now that melting is accelerating so much, we're finding measurements we make are showing vastly greater predictions about how much sea level rise we're going to see in the next few decades. These are some other estimates, one the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2007, the new estimate are estimates made from recent measurements where we're looking at the ice melting in a really accelerated way. And we see now that we're predicting at least a metre of sea level rise by the end of this century. And um, many people, many scientists are predicting much more than a metre. In fact, some go up to four metres. Uh, one of the most respected Arctic scientists that there are, Kony Stefan, who was a, a, a Swiss scientist, and very, very sadly, last year he was killed when he went through the ice, uh, when he went through the ice near his camp uh, on the Greenland ice cap, that he was convinced that the trends were showing that by the end of this century, there would be four meters of sea level rise due to the melt of the Greenland ice sheet. And this is a terrifically awful figure. If you consider four meters of extra water sea level around the entire planet, the result will be catastrophic. So already we have dire warnings of what sea level rise is going to do. And we can see that it's happening because if we go and look at the ice sheet in Greenland during the middle of the summer, we find unprecedented effects. And here's a visit I made in uh, August the 1st of two years ago. And this happened to be the day on which the, the air temperature reached 21 degrees. This is extraordinary because normally in Greenland, the temperature doesn't even get anywhere near the freezing point, even in the middle of summer. We're up to usually about minus 20 or minus 30 degrees, even in summer. Here it was plus 21, and there was a massively rapid melt going on. So here we see the ice sheet, and then this is near Kangalusarak, and we can see that it's melting um, and if we look at it, look at a part of it where we can, we can see over a great distance, we're finding this extraordinary melt effect called black ice. And the reason is that the ice sheet is melting very fast. The, uh, the ice is going away. And as the ice melts, the dirt is left behind. And there's a lot of dirt. The dirt on the Greenland ice sheet comes partly from soot, from fires, especially the huge brush fires that the continent has been suffering from. Um, also algae, um, just wind blown dust. So there's, there's a layer of dirt and dust on the ice sheet, which um, discolors it, makes it dark colored so that it absorbs more radiation and the ice warms up more rapidly and it gets darker and darker because as the ice melts the ice gurgles away goes away down down melt um, channels disappears towards the sea but the dirt stays behind and stays at the surface getting darker and darker so this is what we call black ice and wherever we look on the ice sheet we find it covered with a layer of this black or brown ice, um, which is dirt. And that dirty ice is melting much more rapidly than the old clean ice used to do. So here we see brown coloration of the, the ice. And 
uh, where it's melting here, we're having m m very, very rapid meltwater rivers flowing down towards the sea, an old network of glacial rivers. Here we see one such river. Um, is flowing this way. This is really fast flowing water rushing down the hill. Um, the, it's melting its way down through the ice sheet. So there's a little part of the ice sheet which is white where it's washed away the dirt as well. But over the rest of the ice sheet, the dirt remains. And here we have dirty ice. And this is where it's worked its way down to form an interior lake in the ice cover. Again, here's the dirty ice, the black, the black ice, and the melt here has flowed downwards into an interior lake, and then the lake will drain out towards the sea. What's producing this black ice? Well, many, many things, but one of them is brush fires. And the, and it, Unexpectedly, we're finding a huge level of fire, blush, brush fires at high latitudes in the north, uh, especially Siberia. Everybody thought, well, Siberian tundra, that's wet, soggy, horrid, and will never burn. It, it's wet. And yet, even though it's wet, because there's such a lot of, down, of downward flowing heat uh, now from, from global warming, it actually catches fire. And not only does it catch fire, but the, the fire remains through the winter. It smoulders through the winter and comes up again as major fire each summer. And uh, the Russians have calculated that the total area occupied by this brush fires of Siberia is greater than the total area of brush fires in the whole of the rest of the world. And that includes areas like um, Australia, um, California, all of these famous fire areas, they still don't add up to as much of an area as Siberia. And of course, the smoke from the Siberian fires uh, fills the Arctic, it gets as far as the North Pole, and certainly it deposits soot all over Greenland. Here we see a very flat part of the Greenland ice sheet. This is another part of the ice sheet further north. And here um, the black is more uniform instead of it being uh, black in some parts and white in others. Uh, because it's very flat, we see the black uh, occupying all this area. And uh, you know that this is dark and therefore it's melting more rapidly than uh, the ice used to melt and giving us a more rapid growth of global sea level. We can see this temperature effect if we look at um, the surface air temperature over Siberia, we find that um, the heat that's driving the Siberian brush fires is because Siberia itself is much warmer than it uh, used to be. And here we see the temperature of Siberia uh, compared to uh, previous years. And we find the last 20 years, it's been significantly warmer. This is just an example of another kind of brush fire, which is impressive, but not as impressive as the Arctic. This was a, this one which I encountered driving just down the freeway in California near Pas Pasadena. And I saw this fire. I thought, well, this is a building on fire. In fact, it was a brush fire in a canyon and closed the freeway for about four or five days. So this is, this is impressive, but it's not as impressive, in fact, as the Arctic. The result of all this, with all of the melt that's going on because of the, the, the warming of the ice sheet and the, the effect of the, the dirty ice in, in, warm, in warming it even more, is that uh, sea levels are rising due to uh, the Greenland ice sheet 
more and more rapidly. So this shows the sea level rise since 1993, and certainly the rate of rise, which remember was only 20 centimeters since the beginning of the 20th century, already just in this period here, we see a rise of 80 centimeters. Now, there's also, of course, uh, an increased accelerated warming of the Arctic because uh, temperature and, and carbon dioxide go together. And we are seeing accelerated warming here of uh, uh, going on over the entire world, in fact. But of course, we know that that's going to be accelerated more in the Arctic. The alarm was sounded, as we all know, by Greta Thunberg. And um, we should, uh, as an aside, um, I can say her grand, grand uncle was um, a, the Swedish scientist who first discovered how the greenhouse effect works. So she comes from a very distinguished family. But her concern about the fact that these changes are happening while we are doing nothing, we're not doing nothing, but we're not doing anything enough to make a difference. So what can we do about all this? Firstly, we can reduce carbon emissions. And this is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change wants us to do, to reduce the amount of, of burning that we do of, of fossil fuels, and that will reduce carbon emissions. The trouble is, it's, it's a false, it's, it's, it's a false solution because carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere virtually forever. If we, if we release CO2 by burning uh, fossil fuels, by, by uh, driving a big car, then the CO2 stays in the atmosphere. It doesn't go away. So uh, if we reduce our emissions, all we're doing is causing the climate to still get warmer but at a lower rate. But because it's already too warm, we're not saving ourselves. The only way to save ourselves is this solution I show here, which is to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that way will reduce the greenhouse effect and maybe save the planet. We have to make the biggest effort into taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And we're just not doing it. And we can see why, firstly, because people are reluctant to give up on fossil fuel use because we depend so much on it. If we look at our usage of, of energy on the planet, we see, to our horror, the three biggest sources of energy are all fossil fuels, that is coal, oil and natural gas. If we want to look at a renewable energy, which doesn't make the climate worse, we have to go down to these minor components of our fossil fuel, of our fuel usage, that is nuclear, uh, that's the yellow, hydropower, which is green, and renewable, which is solar energy and wind energy, which is this very small element in the bottom right-hand corner. This is what we need the planet, if we want to save the planet, then as well as taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we should be emitting far less. So that little brown uh, component here, which is solar and wind energy, should be the main component of our energy use. Instead, it's the smallest component of our energy use. We are really failing. And this is what it all means is business as usual, which is what we, we mean by how we're living on this planet, involves constantly warming the climate. How do we stop that? Well, we can cut our emissions aggressively, which is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says we should do. But all that will do is to bring the, the rise down to a lower rate of rise. It doesn't actually 
bring the, bring the warming down to, to below zero. So the best we can do is this black line. So we have to add carbon dioxide removal. And only if we do that, can we get the curve down to a decreasing level of carbon dioxide. And I've put a little thing here called SRM, solar radiation management, because there is a way we can buy ourselves a little bit of time by using techniques like this one called marine cloud brightening, where we have um, unmanned ships, that's uh, drone ships, uh, containing pumps, which pump finely divided uh, water particles up the inside of these masts and injects the particles into the bottoms of marine clouds. Marine clouds have got low, uh, at low level, they're the dismal grey clouds that we see over Britain. They're not, um, they're not just marine clouds, they're the dismal grey clouds. And adding these uh, particles, water particles, which are very tiny, uh, put, uh, they're produced by fine nozzles, that um, brightens up the cloud. So the cloud reflects radiation more efficiently and cools the climate. So we can get a little bit of climate cooling simply by affecting clouds. And we ought to be doing that, of course, but we're not. It was invented by a Scottish scientist um, called Stephen Salter. And um, what we should be doing if we are a leader in trying to control climate change, as we claim to be, is we should be applying marine cloud brightening, uh, making use of a British development. But we're not. We're not spending money on this because the British the British government is too stupid and too stingy to do so. Um, air capture, though, is, is the ultimate solution. And we have to, to take away carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we have to do it on a large scale. And we need to find a cheaper way of doing it as well. At the moment, the methods we've developed cost several hundred dollars per tonne of carbon dioxide removed. But we really want to get the price down. And the estimate is we want to get it down to $40 a tonne. Now, a tonne is doesn't sound much, and it's not. But what we need to get rid of per year is 40 gigatons. A gigaton is a billion tons. So we need to get rid of 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year if we're going to match the amount that we're putting into the atmosphere. Now, that's a massive call. Can we do it? We can. Yes, just about. Um, because there are techniques that will do this job. Um, the first method that's been developed in California by a company called Blue Planet turns the carbon dioxide into limestone nodules. So what it does is suck the carbon dioxide through a filter, uh, which absorbs it into sodium hydroxide solution. Then you have to then do something with that carbon dioxide. You, there's 42 billion tons of it. So they do a reaction with calcium oxide, which turns it into a rock, limestone. And you can then grind that up and use it as, a, as road uh, repairs. You can use it to make cement out of. And uh, it's, it's a brilliant solution. And this is one of the things they've done with it, is these nodules are mixed with concrete and given, given you a concrete aggregate, which is actually carbon negative. Concrete is usually a terrible material, which um, produces a huge amount of carbon dioxide when you make it because of the, uh, your cooking cement. But here, because we're using carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, we have carbon negative concrete which is a wonderful development. And in fact, they've demonstrated that it works by concreting over the roof of one of the airline terminals in San Francisco airport. And it's, that's, that's, this shows this demonstrator in action. The, um, so that's number one. 
Number two, uh, another rival method was developed by a company in Switzerland called Climeworks. And um, the interesting thing from our Arctic point of view is that uh, what they do is simply suck the carbon dioxide out of the air and pump it underground. And they do this in a site in Iceland and um, near a, a, a geothermal power station. And that there's virtually infinite or very large amount of space underground because all the caverns underneath the 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 ice the the underneath the the uh, continental sh shelf here underneath Iceland. So Iceland has got a lot of is sort of hollow, and you can pump carbon dioxide down underground. So that's a big site that's being developed in in Iceland by this Swiss company called Climeworks. Whatever you do, you have to take the air and pump it through an absorber. And so you, there, there will be bigger and bigger banks of these absorbers in the future, wherever we can build these things. This is one that's being built in uh, British Columbia. So that's what, how we can hope to save the world with carbon dioxide removal. So in the meantime, we, we are looking at how fast the uh, ice is melting and how much the dirt is affecting the, uh, the, grow, the melt of the ice sheet. So here's some, some recent work we've done. And in fact, this was done with a group of helpers who are actually uh, rally drivers. The, the odd thing was a very on, uh, entrepreneurial company called Extreme E has been running a rally on the, on the Greenland ice sheet to draw attention to climate change. And the reason they can draw attention is that the rally is done using electric cars. And they've got some very big names uh, to take part in th these races. And I'm, I'm the I'm leader of the science committee, which, which, which does supportive science at the time that the races are held. And one of the key drivers of, the, of the, the teams taking part is actually a normally a Grand Prix driver, Jensen Button, who you probably recognize here. And he came out to help do measurements on the ice sheet with us. And here's another uh, Grand Prix driver who's become a rally driver called Kate Munnings. She, in fact, was the winner of the races that were held just a couple of weeks ago. And you can see how she's helping here. We're looking at the ice sheet with the black ice, uh, as I, that I've discussed. And what we want to do is to take samples of that ice with the little dirt particles on it. So we can take that back to the laboratory, which in this case is in Italy, uh, the Turin Polytechnic, and uh, see what's, what's the composition of this black. Uh, dirt? Is it just dirt? Is it algae? Or is it actually soot from the brush fires that we've been having this year? In which case we're in a real problem because that's, that's increasing the amount of soot very rapidly. So here she is taking a sample in her sample bottle. And here's a sample bottle closed, which enclosing a, a, a small sample of ice and a sample of the dirt that is found with it. So that's what we're doing at the moment. We just did that a couple of weeks ago and I was up there with them. Uh, and um, we'll, we still have to do the analyses of all this data, which we'll do when we get the samples to chew in. So that's what we know about the Greenland ice cap. And we'll know more about it when we can analyze these samples. And um, we hope that the, uh, the additional blackness coming from the, the dirt from, from soot is not going to have a big effect on accelerating the ice melt. If it does, that will accelerate um, sea level rise and that will cause a great deal of trouble for the planet. 
and let's hope for the best. Thank you. Okay. Well, any questions after the gloom and doom of the Greenland ice sheet? <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, I just had a quick question on Button uh, as well. Was it is it a British connection that uh, you have British drivers there, or was Google. was it just incidental? Uh, the question. Yeah. Why don't you answer the question? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. No, mine was just regarding the uh, rally and the drivers. Yeah. Since both were British, I was wondering whether it was a Cambridge or British connection that you had British drivers there on the project? Yes, no, not really. No, there's no specific British link there. <laughs> I'm trying to argue from a world perspective. <laughs> okay. Really, there's been a lot of interest from this name because these young teams and they always have a team of a woman. And uh, there's a, a woman and a man driving, and uh, they have as monitors, as uh, trainers, big names like Jensen Button and Lewis Hamilton. So it's coming up quite a lot. And uh, funnily enough, they were planning a very uh, extreme driving rallies in the Amazon forest and then in Ushuaia. And unfortunately, because of COVID, they had to eliminate them. So the next, which is not exactly extreme, is going to be in October in Sardinia. <laughs> so it's, uh, well, something that uh, we hope to participate there. But they found uh, a military area with a lot of sand dunes, and so they kind of have that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Anne says, uh, Anne Schoeffler, who's a member of uh, our council, says that there are interested in engineering solutions. In fact, uh, when we go to Iceland for our fifth uh, uh, conference, uh, Helsady, which is the Climeworks place, is only about half an hour from Reykjavik, but uh, it's not planned in the meeting to actually go there, but uh, one can always rent a car and go, and I think we will try to do that. And uh, I think there is, uh, if there are no other questions, there were a couple of short films that we can I'm, do. I'm just going to play them. Uh, it's not yeah. too late. Um, and in fact, uh, they have been given by Extreme E, um, and they are just being released, so we have permission to use them for our uh, for our Sheraton. So I'm grateful to Extremely for allowing this. Thanks, Ram. Excellent, yes. This is brilliant.
Thank you. Well, those films are just amazing, aren't they? It's just really, well, thank you so much. I think we've run just a bit over to the next. 